I am thrilled to welcome today's keynote. Today's world is full of more change, more competition, and more options than ever before. As a result, we get more advice and answers from experts every single day. Our next speaker, Jay Akunzo, regrets to inform you that he does not have all the answers. However, it's his firm belief that you do. Jay is the author of the upcoming book, Break the Wheel, and the founder of Unthinkable Media, which creates audio documentary shows with brand clients. He's the former digital media strategist at Google, head of content at the marketing tech giant HubSpot, and vice president of brand at the venture capital firm NextView. Jay's thinking has been cited in courses at Harvard Business School and by writers at the New York Times, The Washington Post, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, and more. One publication called Jay a marketing anti-hero. So he immediately bought a Batman mask. Unfortunately, his wife would not let him bring it or wear it today. As a speaker, he has more fun on stage than is technically allowed in this country or any other country. Please give a big, warm welcome to Jay Akunzo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Build Business, and welcome to another great year of Build Business. If I were to tell you that somebody thinks for themselves, what might you picture? What kind of person comes to mind? Maybe a, a rebel? Somebody who breaks the mold? Somebody who plays their own music despite what society says? Maybe a genius? Somebody who explores the cosmos and sees into the future and solves the problems of the universe? Or maybe you picture an inspiring voice? Somebody like Maya Angelou, who moves you emotionally. Or maybe, when I say that someone thinks for themselves, you picture mm, kind of a weirdo. Yeah. He's special. He's our little think for himself -er. But we love him, though. We do. My point is that we have all these preconceived notions of what thinking for yourself means. You have to be a, an outlier of sorts. You have to be a rebel or a genius or inspire millions or you have to be kind of a weirdo. And in this way, society has radicalized what it means to think for yourself. But in our work, thinking for yourself is not a radical thing to do. It's a necessary thing if we're gonna do our best work. And that's why we're here, right? That's why we come to build business. That's why we're part of this community, is we aspire to do our best. But way too often we get this sense that what we're doing is average. Maybe we're stuck and we don't know how to move forward, so we just keep repeating the things we've always done the way we've always done them because that's how we do things around here. Or maybe we're copying. We're doing whatever someone else says we should do. Or it, we're copying our latest trend that we love, our favorite expert. Or maybe we're just not seeing the results we think we deserve given how hard we're working. Whatever the case, there's this gap that exists between the work we aspire to do and the work we're doing. The results we'd like to see and the results we're actually seeing. And that is so frustrating. So I wonder, what does it really take to do our best work? Well, where we usually start our process is we look for best practices. And our hope for best practices is that our work will look like this. We're doing our work day to day, it gets hard, we encounter that gap, but then we find the best practice and implement it and instantly we're whisked away to the promised land where finally we do our best. That is our hope for best practices. But our reality looks a little bit more like this. <laughs> oh boy. Over and over again, we try the tried and true. We jump on the new trends. We find the tips and tricks, the cheats and hacks, the gurus and the get there quick schemes. And we just keep hoping and praying that one of them, one time, will deliver us to the promised land, will deliver as promised. 
And in the internet age, this process has gone insane. There is so much information and advice out there. But our problem is not the volume of information. No, it's how we make sense of it. It's how we make decisions in marketing today. We make decisions in one of three different ways. Each carries a bit of danger to them. The first and maybe the most popular way to make decisions is to prioritize a best practice that carries weight in our minds. This is the conventional wisdom, whatever is most common, but that can be rather dangerous. For example, in the newspaper business, there's a convention that you should use something called broadsheets when you publish your paper. If you're gonna do a print edition, broadsheets, about 22 inches, will serve you well. That is the convention it has been for years. But in the early 2000s, a British paper, The Independent, decided to break from that tradition and they were criticized by their peers. Now what those peers didn't realize was where broadsheets actually came from in the first place. In the year 1712, the British government imposed a tax on newspapers, and it was based on the number of pages that you published. So being very clever think for yourselfers, they just increased the sizes of their pages. They could print the same number of words on fewer sheets and avoid the tax, and so broadsheets were born. Now, in the 1800s, that tax was repealed, but by then it didn't matter. Broadsheets had become the industry standard, the conventional wisdom. And so in the 2000s, when the independent decided to shrink their pages, they were ridiculed. But what's more ridiculous in reality? Clinging to a best practice born centuries ago based on a tax that no longer exists? Or questioning that to think for yourself? The Harvard Business Review later spoke with the independent. Not only did that paper save money after the change, they sold more print editions. So just because we're doing something that's really common in our space doesn't mean we're doing what works best for us. And so some of us, we don't look to the past to inform our decisions, oh no. We look to the future, the best practice that professes to be the latest trend, whatever is newest. We love when someone can stand on a stage and tell us what will 2018 be the year of? What will 2019 be the year of? Does anybody remember what 2017 was the year of? Still, we love the new, but that can be a dangerous way to inform your decisions too. For instance, in 2010, the Google AdWords team released a new feature for search ads called site links. You've either used them or you've definitely seen them before. They're those little extra headlines below the main one. Those are called site links. Google used one benchmark they found during testing of this feature to convince advertisers to switch it on, 30%. During testing, on average, ads with site links got 30% more clicks than ads without them. Simple logic, isn't it? More clicks means more traffic. More traffic means more sales or business driven by your website. But that's not a guarantee. However, what was guaranteed was that Google would make a ton of money on those clicks. Now, I will never forget that metric, 30%, or this feature, site links, because I was on the Google sales team at the time. Within months, we convinced millions of advertisers to switch on this feature. Google basically released their thousands upon thousands of global and very charming salespeople, and also me, and we convinced the world to use this feature. But then, thousands of small businesses started calling, and they were angry, because while they'd seen more clicks, their budgets had been drained, and they'd seen no additional business through their websites. Their websites were a mess. So what did Google tell me to tell them? Turn off site links until you figure it out? Nah. Google told me to tell them to turn on Google Analytics. The company was laughing all the way to the bank and I sat there sick to my stomach. And then I looked at my sales quota for the quarter, 104% to target, hooray me. Why were site links a new trend? Why did they become a best practice? Because Google wanted them to be. Just because we're doing what seems newest in our space doesn't guarantee we're doing what works best for us. And then there's that third way we make decisions. It's not based on the conventional thinking, no. It's not based on the new trend, absolutely not. It's based on no plan at all. It's total chaos out there, people. Marketing has gone crazy on us. Most of you get this. You're like, yeah, that's totally me. Some of you are in denial. So let me explain what happens. We're gonna jump on every channel, every trend. We're gonna be on Twitter because that's a thing. Great, when should we be sending those tweets? Well, the top report on Google says we should tweet at 3 p.m. Okay, but now that that's out there, guess what happens? That is no longer the best time to tweet. 
But we don't have time to optimize that, do we? No, because we also have to care about email marketing. Email marketing is incredibly important for any business. But why are there some experts out there saying email marketing is dead? That makes no sense to me as a marketer. Email marketing is dead, but do I have time to analyze that? Oh, no, I don't, because here comes Snapchat, and I have to be on Snapchat. <laughs> Somebody emailed me, hey, what's our Snapchat strategy? I have no idea, but we're gonna open an account. Oh, yes, we are. But then Facebook bought Instagram, and Instagram starts copying everything Snapchat's doing, so we are also going to be on Instagram at the very same time. But have you heard, everyone? It is the era of video. Oh, yes, it is, the era of video. Are we making enough video, marketing enough video, optimizing it, getting results from it? Are we, no are we embracing the era of video? That's what we live through right now, the era of video and also podcasts. It's also the era of podcasts. You can't forget about that. It's the era of podcasts. But podcasts are also a subset of something larger called voice. Do you know this? Voice is eating the world. Voice is eating every way we communicate today. Are we willing to embrace that voice is the future of marketing people? Hey, Alexa, please punch me in the face. Okay. It's like we're trapped. We're stuck in this never-ending cycle of best practices, conventional wisdom, and trendy new tactics. Each one professes to save us, and none of them ever do. It's madness. We have to get out of this cycle. Over and over again, we're promised that best practices worked best for others. But the real question we should ask is, how do we know what works best for us? Well, very simply, we have to add in what best practices miss. We have to add in the us. The details of our own situation hold the clues we need to make better decisions. Because the point isn't to know best practices. The point is to contextualize that stuff to work in our situation. Best practices are something we don't talk about often enough. They're just a decent place to start. They're what works on average but we don't aspire to be average. They're what works in general, but we don't operate in a generality. Our context holds the clues for better decision-making and better work. If only we would embrace that. Mike Brown was struggling to make decisions in his work, but when he changed his approach, things got better. At first, he was running this business, Saratoga Coffee Traders, in Saratoga Springs, New York, and it was going terribly. So terribly that he had to sell all of his stuff he had to sell his house and his car, and he had to move back in with his mother. Now, this is completely true. My mother is half Italian, half Jewish. She would have loved that. <laughs> Different story for Mike. And so Mike did what a lot of us would do when things aren't going so well. He looked for some best practices. He talked to some experts. And every bit of research he did pointed to the same fatal flaw in his business. You see, Mike was roasting the wrong type of coffee bean. There are two common types of coffee beans in the world today. There's something called Arabica, and Robusta. Arabica makes up about 70% of the world's crop, and it makes coffee that looks like this. And it's served in places that look like that, to people that look something like this guy. <laughs> can I be honest? I think you have only two choices, OK? You can go all glove or no glove. <laughs> there is no halfway. But the point is Arabica is delicious. On the other hand, the stuff Mike was using, Robusta, uh, not so much. It's like this grainy, gritty stuff you pour into hot water when you just need your fix. That's Robusta. And so now Mike understands the best practice. There is a right and a wrong bean to roast, and he was roasting the wrong one. Don't roast Robusta beans. One day, a customer, one of his few, came into the shop, a truck driver about to embark on a long journey. And he said, Mike, hey, what's the strongest cup of coffee you can give me? And Mike did his best and sent the guy away. And then he thought, you know, I've actually heard that request several times before, always from the same type of customer, truck drivers, construction workers, entrepreneurs, hard-charging, hard-working individuals. And he thought, I got plenty of time on my hands here in this empty shop. Why don't I surprise that group of people? I'll create the world's strongest coffee. And he tinkered, and he tested, and he roasted, and he did indeed create the most potent blend of coffee known to mankind. And he called it Death Wish Coffee. Today, Deathwish is a thriving e-commerce brand. They sell millions of this stuff all over the world. They have hundreds of thousands of passionate fans and followers, people who see themselves reflected in their marketing. <laughs> Do 
So good. And these passionate fans and followers helped Death Wish win a contest run by the tech company Intuit. 15,000 businesses entered, and Death Wish won. And the grand prize was a free Super Bowl ad on TV. That's a $5 million value that they got for free. And this is the ad they chose to run. The day of reckoning is upon us. My brothers, what is life if not to die a glorious death? Fear not, for tonight we drink in the hearts of Valhalla. Death Wish Coffee, fiercely caffeinated. <laughs> Unbelievable. Let's hear it from Mike. And the best part is that Mike and Death Wish, they got all these great results by roasting Robusta coffee beans. What? That's not supposed to happen. He ignored the best practice and got great results, finally. Why did that work for Mike? Well, the first thing he did so well when he turned his business around is he articulated his aspiration. He said, I'll create the world's strongest coffee. And right away, that helped him make better decisions. And it's a good decision to keep roasting Robusta if you're Mike, because it turns out when you roast those beans, you lose less caffeine than when you roast Arabica. That's pretty darn useful if your aspiration is to create the world's strongest coffee. So sure, from the outside looking in, it's insane what he chose to do until you understand his aspiration, his context for his work. You see, Mike knows something powerful about thinking for yourself. When we question conventional thinking, using our own context, we make better decisions faster. If we can articulate what we are trying to do day to day, what we aspire to do in our work, then all those best practices out there, they stop looking like answers and start looking like possibilities. Then it's up to us to vet those possibilities in our context. Ask yourself, in a world full of best practices, what are the right practices for us? What is our Robusta coffee bean? And once we know what we aspire to do, do we know enough about the customer, about the homeowners we serve, to make good decisions? Mike learned about his customers by pulling out an insight from his data. And his data was simple. Customers kept asking for stronger coffee. And now it's an easy assumption to make that his insight is they want stronger coffee. But Mike wondered why. Well, obviously they want more caffeine than the average cup. Okay, why? Well, clearly they want more energy during their day. Great, why? Well, uh, let's see here. They are truck drivers, construction workers, entrepreneurs, hard-charging, hard-working individuals. Mike's customers don't want stronger coffee. They don't want more caffeine. They don't even want more energy. No, in reality, Mike Brown's customers want the ability to work themselves to death. And so that is exactly what he sells. When you operate like this, you move your business from a commodity to the exception. In the coffee business, plenty of his competitors sell stronger coffee. Plenty sell more caffeine, and some even sell the promise of more energy. But Mike and Death Wish, they're the only ones who sell the ability to work yourself to death. And his customers love them for it. They post all over social media with pictures of the product. This photo uh, with the gentleman in the glasses, by the way, that's a post on Instagram. Does he look like a millennial to you? <laughs> Just wanted to clear that up. Some people love this brand so much, they even get tattoos of the logo on their legs. For example, no, absolutely not, no. <laughs> Everyone over here is like, no, no. Respect for this guy just went, no. Now, if I did that, I'd no longer be married. I don't know if these people are married. Probably not. But Mike gives them discounts for life. Hey, I know your wife left you because of the tattoo. Here's a discount for coffee. And it's all because Mike understands. When we pay more attention to the customer than to the industry, the customer pays more attention to us. We're so obsessed with what goes on inside of our industry echo chamber. And that's fine. That's great. SMPS is such a wonderful organization, both nationally and regionally. And Build Business is an amazing event to come and learn and get inspired and do better work. But we can't lose sight what, about what all of this is for. The customer, the homeowner, the people that we serve. We can't lose sight of that. So ask yourself, are we spending more time? Oh, man. <laughs> that was a surprise for Julie. Are we spending more time learning about our customers or marketing? 
Speaking of people who learn about their customers a little bit more, where's Julie? Julie Yuval, where are you? Where are you? You're somewhere in here. She's in the back. She's in the back. Okay, she, she knew this was coming, I guess. She escaped. Julie told me a story before I came up on stage about her use of Death Wish to focus more on her customer. She said she was running some account-based marketing to try and win a new deal over at Beck Technology. And she was gonna send this person some coffee. Now she couldn't send just any coffee. She couldn't send the average cup. She wanted to do her best work and be exceptional. So she sent Death Wish coffee. And the customer called and said, hey, was that a threat? But in the end, Julie won the deal. Let's hear it for Julie. Yeah. Ask yourself one more time, are we spending more time and effort and money to learn about marketing and sales or the customer? That's what this is for. What is our version of the death wish insight or the threat that we sent our customer? <laughs> Good job, Julie. And then once we have that insight about our customer, can we test it? Can we stop focusing on final success and test and learn to ensure we're on the right path towards it? That's what Mike did so well. Mike embraced a series of constraints to create the first bag right there of Death Wish. He said, I'm gonna create one new roast with more caffeine for one type of customer, selling at the rate of one bag per week sometime this quarter. And all he wanted to see was a visceral response from a few people, not massive sales. He wanted signal that he could potentially get more sales. And once he got that emotional outpouring about this product, he leaned in. He created tons of content to promote the product, and today they have tons more products they sell to tons more people. But it's all based on how Mike makes decisions and orients both himself and his team. You see, when we make learning the goal instead of results, we tend to get better results. We're so obsessed with skipping right to the end. We want the answer, the trend, the tactic, the best practice. But the only thing we can say with confidence is in this world, the answer is gonna change. So instead, if we could walk into any scenario and know how to figure it out, we would be unstoppable. Ask yourself, do we want the answer just handed to us on a silver platter, or do we know how to find our own? What do we understand better in the end? Best practices or our context? Mike's story shows us that it's possible to be our best by focusing way more time on our context than anything else. Some people might say that Mike succeeded because he didn't know any better, and I would say, you know what, he actually did know better. He knew his situation better than any expert or best practice ever could. What if we did too? I wanna go back to that weirdo I showed you at the very beginning because this weirdo is me. Me as a kid. And not much has changed, if you can't tell. I still do that every Christmas. The sweater's gotten a little bit hard to wear. I got a little belly going underneath it, but hey, it works. And I've struggled with who I am in the face of one specific best practice in my chosen profession of public speaking. It's called blocking. It means intentional movement. So as a speaker, I'm supposed to establish different areas of the stage as having different types of meaning for you. So, um, so for example, if I were to stand over here, every time I'm here, something bad should be happening in the story. Mike is struggling. There's no death wish quite yet. He moved back in with his mom. But then, as I move across the stage, things should be getting better, and you should sense that as an audience. And when I reach this side, <gasps> success. Something great is happening. Death wish has been born, it's thriving, Mike is doing really well. That is blocking, that is intentional movement, and it's a best practice, it's very common in my profession. But what if? What if I want you find people to feel good when I visit you once in a while, not just bad? Or what if every stage I speak on is slightly different? I've never been on a stage with two podiums and this many monitors, it's true. Or what if every room is laid out very differently and I have to account for that? Or what if I'm that weird and quirky and energetic guy and I just can't sit still and so I'm crazy out here and the cameraman back there really is annoyed? Sorry, man. Or what if I'm Italian? I am and I speak so much with my hands that if I sat down on them, I would just be quiet. <laughs> That's who I am. And I've struggled with that for years. In fact, I would do something terrible to try and fit the mold of a best practice. I would stick my hand into my pocket and try and sit still to make my points. This is me in Cleveland in 2014, hand in my pocket. There it is, hand in my pocket in that speech, hand in my pocket again. Hand in my pocket one more time. Oh, my hand is out. Am I going to be myself and do something original? No, it goes right back in there all over again. You should definitely hire that guy. Oh, God. Why do we 
do that? I don't think I'm alone. We remove the self and what we know to be true about our self, our self-awareness, our situational awareness, and we go seeking our answers out there. Why? I think we have Pike syndrome. There's an old science experiment that might explain our behavior. Imagine a pike swimming around an aquarium. If you dropped in a bunch of minnows to that tank, the pike will immediately eat the minnows. But if you lower them in surrounded by some glass, the pike can't see the glass, and immediately he starts smashing up against it over and over and over again until he decides, well, I, I guess minnows are things that I can't eat. And then you can remove the glass, and those minnows can swim freely all around the tank, undisturbed by the pike. Tasty little morsels are swimming right in front of his nose, and he doesn't budge so much as an inch. This helps explain a concept called learned helplessness. And I think we all suffer to a degree with some learned helplessness in our careers. We want so badly to do well, we want so badly to keep up and get results that we look out there at all that information and advice and we think the best practice must know the way. What could we possibly offer? I think we have to unlearn this learned helplessness to make better decisions, to contextualize best practices and finally think for ourselves. And we can do that with a very simple action. We need to ask better questions. We have to stop obsessing over everybody else's answers for us and instead ask ourselves better questions. If we did that, we would stop acting like experts and start acting like investigators. And I don't think there's anything more powerful we can do in the digital age than act like investigators. You see, experts care about absolutes and that's a fine place to start. But once you're standing on the shoulders of giants, what do you do once you're up there? Investigators care more about evidence. They ask good questions to root out the best solution, not in general or on average, but for them in their context. If we ask better questions, we might act more like investigators. So what should we ask these questions about? Our context. And our context is simply three different things. There's you, the person or people doing the work. There's the customer, the person or people receiving the work. And then there's your resources, which is your means to make the work happen. And if we can ask good questions about each, we might investigate our context and make great decisions. So let's start now with questions that you can ask about you. I want you to imagine that you are Lisa Schneider. She is the chief digital officer at Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, and it is her job to make the dictionary seem cool in the digital age. That's a bit like asking grandma to learn how to twerk. I quit. I like to leave this up there because it takes you a second to notice the woman on the left. <laughs> She's got the right idea though. She's the one that's working, yeah. Let's just move on. <laughs> Good luck sleeping later. My point, however, is that Lisa's job is hard. Not as hard as getting that image out of your brain, but pretty hard. And her marketing team was making it even harder because every day they were posting the same boring stuff on Twitter. In the morning, a word of the day, and at night, a quiz. Every single stinking day. Lisa said she had no idea why they were doing this when she showed up as their boss. Because internally, they weren't boring and bland and predictable. They were witty and warm and wonderful. You get a lot of adjectives going when you work for the dictionary. She loved her team. She felt like she was laughing and learning every time she interacted with them internally only. You see, internally, they weren't posting this boring stuff. Instead, they were sharing things like this. The past, present, and future walked into a bar. It was tense. <laughs> if you didn't like that one, you're really not gonna like this next one. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? Everything's fine, he woke up. <laughs> Look, they work for the dictionary. They're punny people, okay? And so Lisa saw this and she's like, enough is enough, guys. Let's show the world how fun and relevant we really are. That is a great example of an aspirational anchor. What most leaders in marketing do when they're trying to motivate is, is they don't anchor us to anything aspirational enough. And so we don't do our best work. We don't realize our full potential. If we're gonna fix Twitter like Lisa and her team, what do we hear or what do we say? Let's grow our followers, this percent. You're not inspiring anybody. Or how about this, let's go viral. Oh my God, is that still happening? It's 2018 people, that is not a strategy. Hashtag no, stop it, but not Lisa. She said, us together as a team, let's show the world how fun and relevant we really are. And her first chance to do that with her team was Memorial Day weekend. 
Now, as that weekend approached, the team was having this internal debate about a crucial American question. Is the hot dog a sandwich? Crucial. Show of hands. If you think the hot dog is a sandwich, yes, please raise your hand. The hot dog is a sandwich. Okay, a few of you. Show of hands for no, the hot dog is not a sandwich. Yeah, everybody else, you other weirdos. It's not a sandwich. But on that Friday, Lisa and her team wrote a blog post and tweeted this. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. The hot dog is a sandwich. What? And the internet lost its mind. People were like, oh, how could you? I trusted you. You've gone too far. Uh. Or this next woman who pours out her soul on Twitter to a dictionary like she's in Shakespeare when she says this, and yea, for the hot dog is not a sandwich, for the meat is exposed to the heavens, not blanketed by bread, this is my decree. <laughs> Look, the brand took a stance, okay? And these people, they were just taking a stance right back. In fact, the brand even got press coverage from this tweet. And they were like, that's amazing, no one's ever cared this much about our marketing, where else can I put this feeling? In addition to word of the day, they created emoji threads, playful representations of similar sounding words. Isn't that great? They became witty and warm and wonderful. Everything they are in reality, they became in their marketing and the world took notice. Their followers exploded to over 720,000 on Twitter alone. Year over year, they grew their social media impressions 6,000% and their press mentions 7,000% because who is writing about a dictionary in the press? Well, today, it's everybody. BuzzFeed, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Vice, Vox, Mike Slate, NBC, Vogue, Vogue, Vogue. You guys, ready? The dictionary is literally in vogue. So I just go out the way I came up? Look, I don't work for the dictionary. I've found my line. I'll stay behind it. But to Lisa, I would say, mission accomplished, my friend. And why did this work? Because she oriented the team around an aspirational anchor. See, aspirations combine two powerful things about our situation. Our intent for the future and some kind of hunger we have today, some dissatisfaction. Most people can name an intent for the future. For Lisa, be part of the conversation. But the hunger made it aspirational enough. Our voice is too bland. If we fix that, we could show the world how fun and relevant we really are. These statements are a great place to start our investigation into our context. They give us a sort of first filter or first line of defense to vet information more quickly. We've all had that vague desire to do something better than commodity work, but it's hard to articulate what it means. An aspirational anchor makes it specific and concrete. We can take action on it. And these statements are personal. They give us a reason to apply who we are to our work. Because make no mistake, who we are that is the only thing competitors can't access. Who we are is our unfair advantage. Are we using that fully in our work? On my show, Unthinkable, Lisa said this, this isn't manufactured, this is just who we are. So who are you? And have you investigated that enough compared to how much time you spend looking for best practices? Ask yourself, what is your aspirational anchor? And why you? Why can you reach it with you and your team? What is your unfair advantage? Great questions that we can use to start our investigation into our context to make better decisions. And then we can continue it by focusing our questions on the customer. And I've never met anybody who understands their customers better than Stephen Jones. He is the owner and operator of Tulsa Renew, which offers siding and windows and doors in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, when Stephen wanted to start his business, he was gonna compete on service, but he found that really hard because he, he works in a saturated niche. There's so many competitors and they all say the same thing. They've been around forever. They offer high quality products and services, guaranteed. And he didn't have any of those claims that he could make. He was a new entrant into the market. And so he decided to do something uh, maybe questionable. He was gonna be the cheapest option in Tulsa. Clearly some of you guys are veterans because a few of you just went like this. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> and it went about as well as you might think. He was hemorrhaging cash. He couldn't keep it up. Every customer that came his way wanted cheap prices, not great service, and that was a problem. One day, he was on a job at the end of a tiring month, a stressful month, hemorrhaging more cash, and he got a voicemail on his cell phone. 
And it was yet another in a long line of needy homeowners asking the same thing. Hey, Stephen, I saw some holes in the house. I didn't know what was going on. And I know we're going to talk about doing this on the side on the north side, but the east side looks different. Hey, just call me back whenever you get a chance. I'm a little concerned. It was all he could do not to slam his phone to the ground. Now, a lot of us maybe have encountered that kind of homeowner. They feel needy. And if that's our conclusion, we would do things like set up a phone tree so they never actually reach our cell phone or out information them on our website or maybe paint over the holes just so they'll not even ask us a question. But not Stephen. He dug deeper. He wondered why. Why do they seem so needy? Well, they have a lot of questions. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Why do they have a lot of questions? It's because they saw all these holes and imperfections because the job was half done. And that might not be a big deal to us, but the homeowner might not understand why or what was done during the day. And they don't really get the work being done. And that's what they're really after. That's why they're acting so needy. They really want to know exactly what was done the day they leave, from the morning to the night, what was actually done on their homes. Stephen realized if he addressed that, he could offer better services. That insight is a great example of what's known as a first principle. First principle insights are these basic but hard to reach truths about our situation. You have to cut through a lot of conventional thinking to reach what they call in physics first principles. But if you know those first principles, it's like building a home. You have a stronger foundation upon which to build your thinking and your decisions and your business. Stronger, I'd argue, than everyone else who's focused on the conventional wisdom. Most people in his space took those actions. They tried to out-information people or avoid these questions, or they just said, ah, that guy's real needy. Well, let's just finish this job and get out of here. But Stephen understood the first principle insight, and that led him to do something that we might deem innovative, but he deemed logical. He found an app in the App Store called Coach's Eye. It's about $13, something like that. It's meant for coaches and their athletes, and you can take little videos and highlight and narrate and point out things and then send it to them to view later and improve. And he started to use these on the jobs. He would send them once, sometimes twice a day, to explain exactly what was done to every homeowner he met and worked with. Let's take a look at one example real quick. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Bear. Uh, first update of uh, day two. And as you can see, we've got flashing on the bottom um, here on the second pocket. We had that up yesterday. But now we've got the trim on, uh, one by two and one by four going across and uh, on the window. Let's go look at this over here. These small pockets take some extra time, um, but we should still be painting by tomorrow afternoon or Friday. So thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, bye. Really simple, nothing crazy, but it felt amazing to get that as a homeowner. People were blown away that they got that from Steven. And best of all, they started showing their friends, hey, Bill, you know how I'm getting some work done on the house? Check out this video. Wait, wait, Steven sent that to you? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of getting work done next year. Can I get his number? During the first few times he tried this, each video generated 11 referrals. And then he closed seven of them into business. People were coming to him not for his low prices, but for his exceptional service, finally. And so he raised his prices. He's now one of the more expensive providers on the market today. He's even expanded to multiple locations. The guy's a mogul. And it all began with that first principle insight about what his homeowners really wanted from him, what they were really going through. And that led him to do something that we would deem innovative. But to him, it was safe, strategic, even logical. And I think that's the great myth of innovation. It's only crazy, it's only creative until you hear their side of the story. And then it seems rather logical. And if you have a first principle insight, it can make creativity in your world seem logical instead of lofty. It's all about where you start your thinking process. Stephen began in a much better place than his peers. His peers all started here, they're needy. And they took the same route forward because it seemed straightforward. But not for Stephen. He's like, hold on, let me dig deeper here. And when he found that insight, he began his thinking in a better place. And he too took a logical route forward. Now, this route was still unconventional. He couldn't use a precedent or a peer to say, yes, that's the right path. So instead, he let the customer be the guide specifically the emotional outpouring he got initially as a signal he was on the right path, even though that path didn't match a best practice. We're so obsessed with all these passive things in business, with the numbers, but the emotions of those we serve hold clues that we can use to inform our path, even if there's no precedent for it. Because work informed by first principle insights generates that visceral, emotional reaction. We're obsessed with reach. We should care more about resonance. I think Stephen understands the truth about exceptional marketing. 
Exceptional marketing is about inspiring your true believers, the people who see the world the way you do. It's not about convincing the skeptics. Stephen understands that. Ask yourself, what is your first principle insight about your customer? And who are your true believers? A signal you're on the right path towards greater success. This is a great next step in our investigation into the customer. And then we can conclude our investigation of our context with our resources. Such a hard topic for so many of us to talk about openly, but not Mikel Cho. Mikel is the founder and CEO of a company called Crew, or at least he was. Crew is an online marketplace where you can find a designer or a developer for your website or your app. And at one point when I spoke with Mikkel, he said, hey, I just got out of a terrible period of my business. See, we had about three months of cash left to turn things around, and if we didn't, we were toast, done. And he realized that he had to do something creative and new to help keep the business alive. He's the CEO of the business, or at least he was. Now, when most of us hear those words, creative and new, we all picture the same things. The wide open field, Total creative freedom, we finally have it, people. We get to be creative and new. You said so. I get to invent something no one's ever seen before and be a hero to all my peers. I'm gonna put this marketing campaign on every channel ever invented. I'm gonna write my message on the sky. But that's not what Mikkel did. He didn't look for the field, he looked for the box. In fact, he put himself in that box. He's like, my reality is I am resource constrained, people. I have to build an audience, great of makers and marketers, real cool, with no support from the team, a what? And no outside help, come on. And no budget, really? In the next 90 days, what the heck can you even do? But what Mikkel did was he decided to take ownership over his res restrictions. He said, it's all on me, because I'm the CEO of Crew, or at least he was. So here's what happened. Crew had just finished redesigning their website, and they used a bunch of stock photography to do so. And he realized his prospective customers would come to Crew because they were designing their websites too. And he had 10 beautiful photos just sitting in Dropbox. And so he decided to upload those to a simple Tumblr site that he purchased for 19 bucks. Even a startup about to close its doors can afford that. He took one afternoon, about four hours, and he built Unsplash.com. Free, do whatever you want with them, high resolution photography, 10 new photos every 10 days. Seems pretty useful if you're gonna build a website. That might attract some prospective customers to Crew. And then Mikkel posted this to an online community called Hacker News. It's like Reddit, but for startups, Hacker News. And he went about his day. Later, he got a call from the photographer whose photos he used. And he was like, hey Mikkel, uh, what did you do with my stuff, man? My, my website is blowing up. And he went back to Hacker News and it was the number one most voted, most commented on post of the day. And that sent 50,000 visitors to the site in 10 minutes. Best of all, over the next 30 days, they generated 20,000 emails. They built a thriving email list to then generate more business. Actual paying customers for the first time in a long time. And Mikhail then went out on the road to pitch investors and he raised $2.1 million on the back of that momentum, saving his company. And then best of all, the tech press got a hold of it. How a side project saved this startup. And Forbes began using Unsplash photos all over the website, using a little tag giving them credit. And that sent more traffic to Unsplash. Within two years of launching this dinky little side project, photos had been downloaded over 144 million times. Last year, three photos were downloaded every second. Unbelievable. If your photo is featured on the homepage of Unsplash.com, it will be seen by more human beings than if it's on the cover of the New York Times. That is how powerful Unsplash has become. We all crave growth. Crew got it. 100% yearly growth. But then Mikkel did something unthinkable. He sold Crew. And he began focusing entirely on Unsplash as a business. And it didn't happen because he had permission to go build a second company. It didn't happen because he had time or budget or even direction at first. But he did have a list of constraints in his mind and he was willing to test and iterate and learn over time. I know we all want that wide open field but it turns out the more boxes you put down, the more tests you run, the more ground you can cover. That's how he created Unsplash Inc. On my show, he told me, this seems like a giant success. We went viral in people's minds. In reality, it was lots of little tests strung together, and you're just seeing the sum of lots of little wins. That's all. He told me that when you need to be creative, constraints are your strengths. Science backs him up. 
during brainstorm meetings, when teams have a list of constraints in mind, they come up with more ideas and more effective ideas, quantity and quality together. One of my favorite studies is from the University of Illinois. They sent a bunch of kids out in a field and said, we've hidden carrots all around this yard. Go find them. And the first group had no fence around the field. And the next three groups had different shapes of fences. And predictably, the people that had fences were more organized and more successful in their search. Creative freedom doesn't work. As much as I like the idea, I don't even think creative freedom exists. Think about it. If I asked every one of you to write an article about anything you wanted, what does your brain automatically do? You start to install your own constraints. What am I going to write about? How long? Where am I going to stand? What app am I going to use? Who do I send it to? Where do I publish it? It's like your brain wants you to succeed so badly that it won't let you operate without constraints. I think we should follow that impulse. And if we do, if we embrace our constraints, we might scale our work based on results, not trends. Who cares what the trend is if it doesn't work for us? That's the point. And we can learn this from one of the best in the business at navigating your resources. His name is Mikhail Cho, and he is the founder and CEO of Crew, or at least he was. Ask yourself, what are your constraints? We don't like to look those in the eyes, but if we embrace them, we might be more creative. And then how might you expand? Not from one box to the field, but from one test to another in a lifelong process of improvement. If I told you that somebody thinks for themselves, what do you picture? Me, I don't picture a person at all. I picture this. There's this really niche, little known television show out there called Game of Thrones, and uh, oh, some of you know it, that's good, this'll be easier. Uh, there's a hero in that show named Daenerys Targaryen. She's the mother of dragons. And Daenerys is gonna ride across the ocean on her dragons and save the kingdom of Westeros from all these ruling families who keep oppressing the people. They keep replacing each other on the throne. She says each one of these families is just another spoke on the wheel. First one is on top, then another is on top, and on and on this wheel spins. And to fix the problem, she's not going to stop the wheel. Oh, no. She's going to, fellow nerds, break the wheel. That's right. Now, we don't live in the fictional world of Westeros. Good thing, too. It's kind of murdery there. It's good. San Diego's much nicer. But I think at work, we all face our version of that wheel. All these best practices all that conventional thinking, all these new trends, they're just spokes on a wheel. First one is on top, then another, and on and on that wheel spins. It was search marketing, then banner advertising, then retargeting with your banners, then social media marketing, and email marketing, and content marketing, and influencer marketing, and ABM, and AI, and voice. It's so much. They're just spokes on a wheel. And this wheel leads straight to the one place we don't want our careers or companies to be, average. We don't have to stop this wheel. We have to break this wheel and make better decisions. We all aspire to do our best work, but our obsession with best practices is holding us back. It's time to embrace the truth. Exceptional work isn't created by answers that others hand us, but by the questions we ask ourselves. We have to ask better questions. So, what is your aspirational anchor? Your intent for the future combined with that hunger you have today. That filter you can use to vet all that advice and make better decisions faster. And why you? What is your unfair advantage for reaching that aspiration? What is your first principle insight? That foundational truth about your audience that if you can reach, you can build back up more original thinking from there. And who are your true believers? Those people that respond with passion. Yes, you finally get what I'm after here. A small number of people reacting in a big way. That's not final success, but it's a sign you're on the right path towards it. And what are your constraints? Can we list out some limitations and talk openly and honestly with our peers and our bosses? If we could, we might be more creative. And then how might you expand, not from a box to a field, but one test after another because we are lifelong learners. That is how you investigate your context. And that is the information that every best practice misses. Now, I'm not asking you to save a kingdom. I'm not asking you to be a rebel, or a genius, or an inspiring voice, or even a little weirdo. But I am asking you to break the wheel. Not using dragons, although that would be pretty sweet, but by asking better questions. By becoming an investigator, 
into your context so you can make the best decisions, not on average, not in general, but for you. Because that's the point of everything that we do, to make better decisions for us. So, in reality, I'm not asking you to do anything radical at all. I might be asking you to do the most practical, necessary, but powerful thing we can do if we aspire to do our best. Think for yourself. Thank you for doing the work that you do, and thank you for your time today. Have a great event, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. Thank you.